Did you know that John Keats was inspired to write To Autumn after a walk around Winchester? Did you know that To Autumn is an ode? Did you know that rather than having 10 lines per stanza, it has 11, which might represent how autumn is overflowing and full of life? Well, you would know those things if you'd watched part one of my analysis of To Autumn. I do recommend you watch that bit first before watching this video, and a link for it is appearing on screen now. And for you clever clogs out there who have already watched part one, well done. In part two, we're going to finish analysing the poem, think about its themes, and look at its meaning, mood, and Keats's possible motivation. So with all that out of the way, here is part two. So this is where we left off in the last video. I hope you've had time to look at those questions and maybe to make some of your own annotations in relation to them. But in just a moment, the video will resume and you'll be able to see some of my ideas and answers to those questions. So, Liam in the video, back over to you. The persona almost mocks and criticises Spring for not having its sounds and songs present. This assault on Spring suggests that the persona thinks that autumn is the best season, and that nervous season could compare to it. By having music, I argue that Keats has personified Autumn as a musician. This could suggest that Autumn is beautiful, as music is beautiful, and is capable of evoking a strong sense of happiness and other emotions in people. A sad tone is created in this stanza through a number of words and phrases, including those that I've now highlighted, so soft dying day, wailful choir, mourn, dies. This negative or sombre tone has been established in the stanza concerned with autumn's end, suggesting a sense of loss and that the end of autumn is something worth crying about. Images of winter creep into this stanza, as the lambs, who were born in spring, are now full grown. A red-breast robin, a clear image of winter, appears, and the swallows gather, ready to migrate south for winter. The last image in particular is uplifting though, as the swallows will return just like autumn will. Before we move on, there are a couple of structural observations that I think would be useful to share with you. So there we go. There's those two structural questions. Have a read, and I think, and let me know maybe what you think down in the comment section below. Remember that enjambment can represent a sense of passion or excitement or breathlessness about the person narrating the poem. Enjambment is used loads in this poem, which could indicate that the persona feels very strongly about the poem's topic, autumn. Considering the whole poem, it's worth noticing that time progresses with each stanza. It is newly autumn in the first stanza, where we see that summer has provided perhaps too much for the overbrimmed, clammy cells, which does create a slightly scornful tone towards summer. The second stanza is mid-autumn, as harvest is well and truly underway, as seen by all of those images of work and rest. The final stanza is at autumn's death, and the final few lines herald winter's arrival. This reminds us that all things have a start, middle and end, and autumn, for all of its celebrated glory, cannot last forever. 
and that is the whole poem analysed in depth. Now we are going to consider the three M's of the poem and if that means nothing to you I recommend that you have a quick look at the second video in this series which is for Simon Armitage's poem The Manhunt, a link for which is appearing on screen about now. So there is my summary of the poem's meaning. I've not actually used any quotations this time. And the reason why is because I'd like it if you could tell me the quotations that you think best sum up each stanza. So please do let me know down in the comments section below. And there is my brief summary of the poem's mood. I've said that it is celebratory and then towards the end it's maybe a bit sad. Is that a fair or acceptable summation? And there I have written my ideas about Keats's motivation for writing this poem. I've included a reference to him being a romantic poet, but I've also mentioned some more specific contextual facts too, as well as those evaluative verbs that are going to be so useful at helping your analysis hit the very top grades. Here we have a theme table, and again this is something that I have explained in my second video of this series, so again the second part of my analysis of the manhunt. In short, I think you might find it useful to produce a large table for these themes on top and then a row down the side for each of the 18 anthology poems. And if I was filling out the grid, this is what I might have done. I don't really think that this is a poem about power, but I do definitely think that this is about nature, and I hope you don't disagree with me there. I've ticked love as I feel like this poem is incredibly passionate. The poem may not be romantic in the lovey-dovey sense, but there is a strong sense of admiration throughout the poem. This isn't a war poem, but this poem can be said to be about time in the sense that it is about a particular season, autumn, but also because there is a clear sense of progression through it. Although this poem isn't about a clear, definite place, it is about man's interaction with land, and so it could be said to be a place poem because of that. It may not be the most immediately obvious theme, but I think it could still apply and maybe bring up some quite interesting analysis. This poem is about man's interaction with nature, so yep, man. And I've included death as autumn almost dies at the end of the poem and nature must die in order for man to benefit from it. Now, I almost ticked religion, as there is an almost devotional element to this poem, but I don't know, I thought maybe it wasn't there strongly enough. I can definitely see why you might tick it, though, definitely, and maybe if I was doing it on a different day, I would have ticked it. So now I've explained myself, what do you think? Let me know how you would have filled out this grid down in the comment section below. We're going to go back to Venn diagrams for this revision task. They are a useful way to start thinking about comparing the poems, especially if you prefer science or maths or if you see yourself as a more visual learner. So set up a large Venn diagram on a piece of paper with the question, how is nature presented across different anthology poems as its title? Give one circle the title of To Autumn, as it will be about that poem. As for the title of the other poem, well, that's your choice. Which anthology poem will you compare To Autumn to? For instance, you could pick Hawk Roosting with its depiction of nature as violent and aggressive. You could pick Death of a Naturalist, which shows nature to be both fascinating and scary. Or you could even pick the prelude, 
which was written by another significant Romantic poet. Once you've chosen your second poem, complete the Venn diagram. Use the middle bit to include details of any similarities that the poems have. So do they use language, imagery or structure in similar ways? Do they use titles in a similar way? Use the non-overlapping bits to write down the differences. What only happens in To Autumn? What only happens in the other poem? Remember that you can and should include both ideas in the Venn diagram. For instance, both To Autumn and the second poem are about. But also techniques. Both poems use enjambment to. Both poems use similes to. Only To Autumn uses adjectives to. Whatever you use though, make sure you're using quotations. If you've listened to that guidance and read the instructions on your screen now and no worries if you need to pause or rewind the video to get a better idea, then you might end up with something a little like that. So here's my example. I chose to compare Two Autumn with Death of a Naturalist. I've put in two similarities as well as two comparable differences, which I've colour coded for the sake of clarity. And if I was making this for real, I would definitely do that so that my notes are easy to decipher. I've also specifically not used too many quotations in this example, but that's only so you don't just copy my example without using your brain. In your version, you would obviously add quotations to your ideas. If I was doing this for real, I would also make sure that I had more ideas than just these four. The more comparisons you can make, the better. Don't go mad though, 20 is obviously way too much. Try and go for 5 plus, 5 to 6, 7, 8, 9, maybe 10 at a push. Right, so there we go. That is Two Autumn Analyzed. I really do hope that this video has helped you with your English Lit revision or learning and that you feel much more confident with this poem now. If this video has helped you out, please do let me know by giving it a like and also remember to subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell too. That way you'll get all of my GCSE English revision videos straight into your subscription feed. Feel free to add a comment to either letting me know how much this video has helped you or asking a question about the poem or adding some of your own ideas, which I would love to see. Doing any of these things also helps my videos to reach even more people. So please do help me to help even more young people. As ever, I hope you have an awesome rest of the day. And remember to take short, frequent breaks from revision, as a burned out student is not a happy or successful student. So if Autumn was a person, what would they be like? Well, in John Keats's view, Autumn is the friend who brings happiness wherever they go. The friend who works so incredibly hard and selflessly for everyone else around them. The friend who maybe sacrifices themselves for everybody else. In short, Autumn, what would they be like as a person? They'd be an absolutely fab person.